Today we're going to continue with soprano bass counterpoint. Yeah. Right here, page 180 to 182. So if we go up here, there's no need to review for a very specific reason. This is on YouTube, uh, last <laughs> lecture, so there's no reason to review. You can just go back and watch it. So now we're going to start with how to add a contrapunctal line, which is how to add a soprano melody. In this context, why is the soprano referred to as the contrapunctal line? I'm going to give, not give the answer away so Sarah can see if she remembers that. It's because it moves in a different direction than the bass note. Okay. And it's because it moves at like different, different like, it's not moving in just strictly parallel motion. And then even whenever it does, like they don't happen in like the same like intervals and stuff. Can you remember an era of common practice music where the soprano was not the melody? Medieval. Yes. Brenna yeah. And what was the bass doing at the time? It was just going, it was just doing one note, like do. Yes. Everyone else did it. In slow motion, they were singing the what, what? The, um, I know what this is. I know what the, the, the cantus firmus. <laughs> the cantus firmus. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I promise I know theory. So this dates back to the beginning of Counterpoint, the Cantus Firmus, which was the main melody of a part of a mass that would be sung by the bass voices in a new composition. Then the contrapuntal line, or lines, would do other things on top of that that sounded good, aka Counterpoint. There could be anywhere from two to six contrapuntal lines, maybe even more. Usually there would be three contrapuntal lines over a bass part. In the context of common practice music theory, this is fancy talk for writing soprano plus bass. So we're learning... Uh, this chapter using terminology unique to medieval counterpoints, but really this also applies to if you're really being picky about having your soprano and bass sound good together. Because this is where all of it comes from. This is where good SATB composing comes from, even if it's not contrapuntal in nature, meaning everyone's moving together. So step one, beginnings and endings. So... Beginning the phrase, the melody should start on any note of the opening triad, be it one or five, but we had, we're not going to use the leading tone or the third of five in the melody. Cadences. A phrase should usually end with either, in order of cadence strength, starting with the strongest, a perfect authentic cadence, or PAC, imperfect authentic cadence, IAC, or half cadence, HC. And as a refresher for, for anyone who may have, for some reason, forgotten what those are, a half cadence is a cadence ending on 5, usually 4 to 5. An imperfect authentic is 5-1, involving either an inversion or the tonic is not in the melody. And perfect authentic is 5-1, where it's in root position and the melody is on do. An imperfect should usually end with a third category in the melody, not the fifth. If you're pairing two phrases together, which we will learn about later on in the semester, we did jump forward for the beginning of this semester. Use a stronger cadence on the second phrase, so HC to IAC, or HC to PAC, or IAC to PAC. If you're Mozart, then ignore that. Strong beats. <laughs> if your harmonic rhythm is half notes in 4-4, four, four, which is what we're doing, then you're going to do a four-measure phrase and end on beat one with a whole note at the, at the fourth measure. If you're using chord notes, then maybe you're doing two or four-measure length, and then you could end on any strong beat, but we're not doing that right now. For example, doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. You start on beat four of an anacrusis, and then you end on beat three of measure two. Step two, harmonic intervals. First off, we're using chord tones in both parts, soprano and bass. So every note of the melody should be part of the chord, just like every part of the bass, that's going to result in the intervals being consonants. So they're going to be unison, third, perfect fifth specifically, sixths and eighths. Now, if you happen to have a diminished chord, uh, then that means there's a potential for a diminished fifth, don't use it. Also, we're inverting our diminished uh, chords anyway, so it shouldn't come up. We should be using thirds and sixths above that. When we talk about intervals between the soprano and bass, we're going to simplify the interval number to be within one or eight, unison or octave. So if the distance between the soprano and bass is greater than an octave, 
you're going to remove octaves from that number until it's within 1 to 8. So if we have two octaves between bass and soprano, we're going to simplify that to say one octave. If we have an octave plus third, we'll simplify that to be a third. The intervals 1 and 8 should be avoided. That's unison or octave or just the same note name. Should be avoided except when we're beginning or ending the phrase. It might happen. We're going to try not to do it. And then the best intervals we can use is what we call the imperfect consonants, or I like to call the harmonic consonants, because we make chords off of thirds and sixths. Thirds and sixths are pleasing and should be used more than the perfect consonants is 1, 5, and 8. That means the order for priority for intervals between the soprano and bass should be the imperfect consonants is 3 and 6, followed by the perfect fifth, followed by the unison or octave. So we're, not, we're going to, at the, the very beginning or end of the phrase, or sparingly in the middle, use the same note name. And then uh, more often than that, we'll use root to fifth, or we'll just be doing thirds and sixths. So either root to third, or third to root, or third to fifth. If we double the third, that's bad. So uh, just like avoiding using one and eight, we're going to avoid having both voices on the third of the chord, which means that the bass is inverted then the soprano shouldn't be on the third of the chord. The bass inverts to the third, everyone else avoids the third. Otherwise, we like using the third. Step three, the types of motion. And if this is fast, that's fine, I'm just going through the notes. Rewind, listen again. Rewind, listen again. Slow down the video if you need to. If one voice repeats a pitch, that static motion that we're going to try to have as opposed to both of them staying put. So we're going to have one voice stay put and the other one change pitches if one voice stays put. We're going to have what's called a parallel imperfect consonance, which is the voices are following each other and they can maintain thirds and sixths, that's fine. But avoid doing it more than three times. And also favor uh, steps over skips and definitely don't use leaps. So you can use steps or skips a lot favoring steps. We'll be giving examples of all of this in a second. I'm getting through it first. And then similar or parallel perfect, similar motion meaning going in the same direction, parallel meaning same direction, same interval. Uh, we're going to not do that with perfect intervals. So if the bass and soprano move in the same direction and arrive on one, five, or eight, this is either a similar or parallel perfect and should be avoided. Parallel perfects is, in, is maintaining the interval of one, five, or eight issue that we need to correct, whereas similar perfect could be allowable in some contexts, which is maybe they were on three and they end up on five, or they were on uh, six and they end up on eight. That's a similar perfect, and we don't want to do that unless the melody steps, which is a thing in voice leading. Voice crossing and overlapping. This is something that doesn't get talked about much. Voice crossing is an obvious one. We don't want voice crossing, which means two voices passing each other and waving high at each other, unless it's the alto and tenor, which we're not using yet. We don't want the soprano and the bass to cross each other. We don't want the bass and tenor to cross each other or the soprano and alto to cross each other. If we're writing this in a way that the alto and tenor could be added later to the composition, then we definitely want the bass and soprano to never get closer than a third. We don't want unisons, actual unisons. So when we talk about unison and octave earlier, we're talking about the same letter name. But when we talk about don't have a unison, we mean the exact same notes. We want them to be on root and third or third and fifth, something like that. Overlapping voices, that's an interesting thing that doesn't come up a lot, but it has to do with ambiguity in the voice's roles. So let's say we have a note in the bass voice being higher than whatever the previous note in the soprano was. So say the previous note in the soprano was C4, and then the next note the bass sings is D4. That's, that's overlapping voices. Or similarly, if the note in the soprano is lower than whatever the previous bass note was. So let's say the bass is on D4, and the next note the soprano sings is C4, then that's called an overlap. And we try to avoid that because it creates ambiguity about what voice is doing what. It kind of sounds like they're passing each other when they're not. We need to have the, the roles of each voice clear. So as you write your contrapuntal line, write the interval numbers between the voices. It makes it easier to keep track of everything. And if in doubt, use contrary motion. So let's look all that in the book with the examples. So right here, we're going to zoom this in a little bit. So here's an example of similar motion arriving on a perfect fifth. That's an issue. 
Here is similar motion arriving on a perfect fifth, but the melody steps. That's fine. Here's similar motion going on a perfect fifth. That's, that's a no-no. Whereas here's similar motion arriving on a perfect fifth with a step. That's not a no-no. Now here is voice crossing. They end up on a unison. And then they straight up cross each other. We're on B flat 3 and D4. And overlapping is a similar issue. Which is, we've got this low G3 and this B flat 3. And the soprano steps away from that. And now the bass goes up to C4. And is a step above where the soprano was. Next, we've got this major third between B flat 3 and D4. And the next thing that happens is the bass goes down. Okay, cool. Then the soprano goes down and it crosses where the bass previously was. Now it becomes kind of uncertain who's doing what. What we're going to hear instead is Do, Re, and Do, T. And that's going to create ambiguity. And then simultaneous leaps in the same direction. So I said that if you have 6, 6, 6, or 3, 3, 3, which we have here, that's great, but we don't want to leap. We don't want to go 6, 6, and leap, or 3, 3, and leap. Whereas over here we're stepping, over here we're stepping, over here we're skipping. That's perfectly fine. So we need to go ahead and put this in Sibelius so we see what all this looks like. This theory lesson is brought to you by Sibelius. Download from the App Store today. <laughs> Wait, that's Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends. Wait, I said Now open. in Sibelius. I don't know. No, that's not true. So we have last lecture's document up here, and we're going to play with this for a little bit. So the fact that I already have all the notes of the triad right here gives us a distinct advantage, which means that we can just pick one of these three notes each time. So I'm going to go ahead and extend this for a second. Remember, our range is going to be A to E, A3 to E5. Okay, that covers our first chord progression, every possible note for the melody. So we're going to start with any note in the tonic triad. We can end on any note in the tonic triad, but we're going to avoid the fifth scale degree. So Sarah, you tell me if we're going to end on a perfect authentic, imperfect authentic. Well, I guess we can't do a half cadence because we didn't do that with this, but do we want to be perfect or imperfect? Imperfect. Okay, that means that we're ending on one mm. of these two E's. Are we going to start on the tonic, the third, or the fifth? Let's let's start on the tonic. Uh, do we want to have any uh, succession of thirds and sixths? Yeah. But it looks like the way that we're going to get to this E is with this D, and then from there if we're stepping, because we can't approach this E from above, we can't approach this D from above, that means we're going to step, we're going to go Do, Re, Mi, so that's our options. Unless we wanted to be lower, but I didn't want to. Okay, the question is, uh, how are we going to get successive thirds? And it looks like what we can do is follow this D, C, this F, D, C, and follow in, the th in thirds. You mm -hmm. see that right there. It's a skip followed by a step, and then we're gonna go to a remi. So that means we're gonna go, we're gonna go A and then F and then E. The issue there is that we're going up a sixth, and we didn't correct after that. Yeah. So if we want to do both, we're gonna have to do a perfect. Yeah. So there we have the step down, leap up, step down, and then we go do t do. And then we step up to a direct perfect. So that's good. So here we go unison. Uh, let's add in the lyric of the interval here. Eight, three, 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 uh, three again. Three again, and eight. Huh, that's interesting. Ooh, what if we just go do re? No, that doesn't work because we did a sixth and then down. So that might mean that it opens up our possibilities of what we can do over here. Maybe two sixths or something. Well, that's F to D. Yeah. Yes, yes, sixths. Hmm. No, I don't like that. Because we don't want to have an octave here. You see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What if? Let's go back to the idea of the IAC then, because we're causing too many problems with our contour. Let's have it down an octave. So I have an octave here, I think, because there's no better way to approach this E. Let's want to go step up, step up to an imperfect. Yeah, okay. So here's where we're at, Sarah. We're at third, fifth, sixth. 
And that opens up a possibility of having several sixths in a row. You tell me if you come up with something here that's going to sound good. But we have a sixth, fifth, third, so that's variety. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'd like to have some, some uh, contrary motion. So this E to this F is good contrary motion. And this gives us a parallel third, which is nice. And then... What there if we, we go. bring that... Yeah. Third, third, third. Sixth, five, three. That that works a lot. So it we took the thing that we liked and we ended up in perfect authentic. It was just we were creating too many issues with having a, a, a leap up to a sixth and having to correct it downward. And it just mm -hmm. it was uh, causing uh, an octave transfer of that third that we were maintaining. It was three, 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 three. So I think this is good. Octave, third, third, third. So C, C, F, A, D, F, C, E. Contrary motion. A, F to a, a sixth. And then G, D, C, E. So we've got one fifth, which is acceptable, but most of it is three. Here we go. Oh, there's an issue. Yeah. We we had a direct perfect without a step here. What if we invert the five? Wouldn't that make the cadence not as strong? Okay, yes. If you interface with five one, the five should be in root. You're right. So we can't. Um, what if... How about that? Okay. Since we're not ending with an octave, let's precede it with an octave. So then it goes... Mi fa so, do la so, which is contrary motion, and then they resolve inwards. I think I would be fine with that octave because there isn't one at the end of the com of the phrase. Yeah, and it sounds it sounds more resolute than the last one. Mm-hmm. It especially would have worked if we were using seventh chords because we, we could have had an F here. We're like yes. a passing seventh. Okay, let's go to this A minor chord progression real quick. Okay, uh, I think we should end this on a perfect authentic. Yeah, since we did imperfect last time. Mm -hmm. This could also be like a direct modulation from this previous phrase, so then it's more satisfying anyway. Yeah! They'll learn about direct modulations next semester. Those are fun. Especially between related keys like A minor and C major. Mm -hmm. If this is a PAC, we're not going to go to low A. Now, do we want to go T do, or do we want to sort of erline our way down? I think T do would sound cool, but. It also gives us contrary motion. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. And then we could contrary motion here as well. Re T do. Mm -hmm. Which means that we could be elaborating. Uh, some sort of erline, but the issue here is that the bass steps up thrice, or rather twice, I suppose, but there's three notes in a row where it's stepping up, which means we need the melody to be going down, as per the rules of, what chapter was that? Some chapter in the Costco Pain talking about <laughs> uh, going between two chords a step away from each other. We need to be in contrary motion in the upper voices. That was so something we, can, we talked about. So we, what we can do is we can start the piece off higher, yep. like higher up, and then just like how in the first example we have the contrary motion in like the last two and a half measures I guess mm -hmm. going away we just mimic that yes I noticed something in this melody up here we have a double lower focal point but I don't feel like fixing it <laughs> it's fine everything's fine it's fine <laughs> rules happen to get broken on a regular basis it's the point of them is to keep things as smooth as possible not to mm -hmm. keep everything perfect Okay, we're not going to be low then. Uh, let's see. So we want to go down. Like this. Re, uh, fa, re, do could be an option. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do we want to start on the third of the chord or the fifth of the chord? We're going to go so, fa, re, do. Or do we want meh, fa, re, do? Meh, fa, re, do. I like that because uh, C was the previous tonic. Mm -hmm. So here's what it sounds like. 
So direct perfect, but it's stepwise. We got lots of thirds and sixths in here. I don't like popping onto the octave here. I don't like using the octave in yeah. the, at the beginning there. That's a bit too strong for the note D. What if we moved it to an A? If we did that, then we would have to change the rest of this phrase because we oh. need to be in contrary motion. Um. Now, T do is a thing you can do in, in a in a five one progression. It just means the rest of the voice is going contrary. And it's something we learn about at the end of the semester. When you go five to six, you end up doubling the third, which is the tonic. So we can do that. So we'll go me, do, ti, do, re, ti, do. Ends up with doubling T though? What if we go re, re, do? That we can, we can have one note moves and one note doesn't. So that means five. So six, five, eight, uh, three, five, three, three, six, five, eight. Seems like the best compromise here. And I'm going to put in some letters here for uh, contrary versus other types of motion. That's contrary. This is parallel. So let's give a listen here. So, so this is a way of writing your bass soprano counterpoint where you're more, more focused on what the bass is doing. Another way of writing soprano bass is writing a melody, either before your chord progression or after, and then writing your bass in following that. I'm a fan of finding what method works for you, and this is probably the best way to work on it. So uh, real quick, I'm going to throw in some inner voices. So we're in first, first inversion. Anytime you're in first inversion, except for the 2-6, you want to not double the third. Now, my students haven't learned this yet, so this is more just me demonstrating, but they have learned about open and closed structure, which has to do with whether the soprano and bass are far from each other. Pro tip, theory students. This part's really easy whenever you write out all of the chords. It is. Um, like we did initially, because then you can just cross off all the notes you've done, and then you don't accidentally double the third a bunch. Yeah, it was that thing that I was doing earlier where every note possible in the core was already there you should probably mm -hmm. do that okay let's see now we're gonna go i have done it on everything since theory still to this day like all my score analysis for like actor piece they always have all of the notes in the key written out on the top of it just in case it's a very very good idea until you internalize okay so this is an issue that comes up when you go between open and close and the solution is just omit the fifth somewhere. So there, C, C, E, C. Again, this is not something that the freshmen have learned just yet, so I'm just doing it as a courtesy. And then uh, B, D, F, we're going to avoid D, so we're going to go... Probably just double the root here. It's awkward because then we're doubling the leading tone, which sounds like doubling the third of five, but whatever. One's going to go up, one's going to go down, because you have to do that when you double... And then avoiding A, avoiding parallel octave. This is awkward because then we're here. I don't like that. Hmm. Whatever. I guess we're doubling C. <laughs> it is what it is. This is fine. It's because our, our melody was outlining the root of both chords, so that's why it got awkward. Okay, mm -hmm. now we're going here. Complete voicing. I 
I don't want that parallel octave. I'm going to fix that. I'm actually just going to double the third. It fixes a lot of problems if I break that rule over some other ones. Parallels are more important to observe. Contrary motion and then doubling tonic here. The third of six. Uh, we can't go A, B because we already did that, so that means we're going down to F. Which is a problem. Augmented seconds. So we've got to fix this. So with the inner voices thrown in, I'm going to have to make a, correct, a few corrections on the melody. Fair. I fixed this. It went Fa, Re, Mi instead of Fa, So, Mi. Which made the tenor able to go Fa, So, So. And that makes a nice little voicing here. And then down here, we're going to have to correct something. Because I want the tenor to go Do, Re. As opposed to the melody. With the inner voices, I think that this will be fine. Contrary motion. Which means... It'd be weird, though, right. having the soprano line go, like, do consecutive skips from the A, D, and the B. Well, we, re we preceded it with a step down, so... Mm -hmm. I have to accept it from myself. I like it. it it's interesting. Uh, a lot of the things we were going for came through here. Contrary. Parallel, parallel, contrary, contrary, contrary. Then contrary, contrary, parallel, contrary, oblique. Actually, this becomes contrary motion. And this is similar. Okay. This is all contrary motion. Nice. Hey. Well, that is putting it into practice and also trying to adapt it to SATB. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing that unless you know what you're doing, because the whole point was just soprano bass counterpoint and not so much the many problems that come with adding SATB to a composition. In fact, I would be more likely to write an interesting soprano line, an interesting melody, putting a chord progression with it and then going from there. Uh, for example, finding ways to make interesting inversion stuff happen, but this is more to do with Cantus Firmus and Counterpoint off of the Cantus Firmus. And we will learn about Counterpoint itself and the rules therein, uh, quote unquote rules, later on. But uh, just like as we were doing, if in doubt, use contrary motion. It fixes a lot of your problems. Sounds really nice. And then sometimes throw in some parallel thirds or six. That is all I've got for today's lecture. I anticipate we'll be doing this again on Monday, and we're going to be going back, and we're going to start learning about, we're in chapter 8. Yeah, chapter 8 is first inversion. That's what I thought. Perfect. So we've been talking about, the reason we skipped to chapter 11 is we want to know situations where we use first inversion in, in, based off of what's going on in the base. And now in chapter 8, we're going to learn all about first inversion because we've already pulled